In 2007, I left the best job that I ever had as an editor at the prestigious Boston Globe newspaper. Why did I go? They offered me a buyout. And at the time, my wife and I were preparing to adopt, and we were told that our child would arrive in about three months. So we decided we would use the money to allow me to be a stay-at-home dad for the first couple of years. Well, those, first, those three months turned into three years of waiting. But during that time, I discovered something, something that changed how I viewed the Earth and my mission on it, something that also changed how we're raising our son, Joey, who's now six. So how did I spend these three years? Well, I'm a writer, so I wrote. I completed my first book, Fat Boy, Thin Man, in which I told the story of going from an obese, angry, lonely young man to a happily married older dad. What transformed for me is that I stopped focusing on the mechanics of dieting and started paying attention to the actions and attitudes that were leading to clearly unsustainable trends in my life. I also began covering what I conceived to be the sustainability movement. So I started covering green building trade shows. I wrote for magazines such as Green Source and E, the environmental magazine. And I started a blog, which I called Sustainably, in which I wrote about developments in the field, but I also wrote about the journey my wife and I were on, trying to become more sustainable ourselves. It took me more than a year of reading, interviewing, and analyzing to come to understand that I didn't know what sustainability was. Like most people, I was focused on mechanics, how to become more energy efficient, how to become better insulated in our house, how to become a better recycler, instead of focusing on the actions and attitudes that were leading to clearly unsustainable trends in the world. Once I came to this understanding, this idea crystallized in my mind. What's the point of trying to sustain the planet if we're not also trying to sustain ourselves? And if we're going to elevate this mission of personal sustainability, how do we do that? A major influence on me during this time was Janine Benyus, a biologist, who in 1997 published a book, Biomimicry, Innovation Inspired by Nature. Biomimicry, the word, is a mashup of two words you've heard of, biology and mimicry, copying life. Biomimicry, the concept, argues that instead of trying to overcome nature to live as we want to in this world, we should ask nature how it is achieving, how it is overcoming the problems that we're encountering in industrial design. So, want to know how to uh, help Olympic swimmers go faster? Look to the shark, and then make bodysuits that mimic the shapes that are found on shark skin. Want to silence the boom of a bullet train every time it leaves a tunnel? Look to the kingfisher bird. Engineers in Japan grafted the shape of the kingfisher onto the front of its trains, on their trains. And all of a sudden, that loud, loud boom became a soft hush. Nature is unquestionably our world's authority on surviving and thriving. It's been sustaining life on Earth for 3.8 billion years. By contrast, as we've already heard tonight, humans have been upright for about 200,000 years. So who do you think fits into whose game? Before we were masters of the universe, the dinosaurs were and for much longer. Every school child knows that dinosaurs were A, much bigger than us, and B, much dumber. But even they weren't so stupid as to spoil the habitats upon which they depended for survival. That distinction belongs to us, the smart ones. Nevertheless, the day came 65 million years ago when an ever-sized asteroid crashed into our planet, dooming that dynasty in a single cataclysmic event. How did nature respond? 
woke up the next day, and kept right on chugging. How's that for sustain ability? I got to interview Janine in 2008, and one of my last questions was simply, are we going to make it? I'll never forget what she said. Some of us will squeeze through the evolutionary knothole and hopefully bloom on the other side, but not all of us. Wait, what did she say? Not all of us? We're not all going to make it? You can see that from there, it was a short leap to what's the point of sustaining the planet if we're not also sustaining ourselves. My passion for these ideas is fueled, as most passions are, by experience. In the first half of my life, I was obese or overweight most of the time, despite having gone on seven substantial, long-term, successful diets. Two of those times, I lost more than 65 kilos, which is about 130 pounds. But every time, I gained it back. And I found a few more. I didn't have a weight loss problem. I had a weight loss sustainability problem. In the second half of my life, I drew back the lens to look at my life from a broader perspective. And what I discovered is that, of course, I needed to change the way I ate, but I needed to do a whole lot more than that. For example, in my yo-yo years, up and down the scale, I would have told you that I had everything covered. I had all the information I needed, I knew what I had to do, I knew more about my life and my issues than you did, so you could keep your ideas to yourself. Thank you very much. This may explain why I didn't have many friends. <laughs> it certainly explains how I kept ending up in the same place every time. I was listening to the advice of one person, me, who clearly couldn't see that his advice was not taking me where I wanted to go. But then something changed. Colleagues of mine in the newspaper where I worked decided, judging by the way I was treating them, that I wasn't a happy person. They also decided, quite accurately, that there was nothing they could do about it. So they appealed to a higher power, one of our bosses, Ed Lafreniere. Now, they didn't go to him to complain, or at least so he ever told me. He said, they said, we think Mike is unhappy. We think he should get some help. We think if we tell him this, he won't get any help, but he'll get angry at us. So we want you to tell him. Now, many times in my life, people closer to me than Ed had made the suggestion that I get some help from my personal life. But when Ed came over to my desk, invited me into his office, and then closed the door, I did listen. How come? He was one of my bosses. But also, he didn't fault me for the way I'd been acting. He related. He told me he had had issues in his personal life. He had gotten some therapy, and it worked for him. So I went to the company's assistance program, which led to a succession of therapists, group therapy, support groups, and even eating disorder rehab. The day I entered, October 21st, 1991, I weighed 165 kilos, 365 pounds. Many of the counselors whom I met in rehab and in therapy, they had had personal issues of their own and been so impressed by their own transformation that they decided they would devote their professional lives to helping people like me. I also got a lot of help from the other people who were in rehab and in support groups, because that's how support groups work. You help each other. Years later, after the essence of biomimicry had really sunk in, I realized that I had been copying nature. When I agreed to let other people help me get better, Nature is nothing but one lesson after another in community, in ecosystems. Everyone isn't all right until everyone is all right. And if one member breaks down or leaves, everybody has to adjust. And then many species show us the 
herd instinct, which shows us that the safest place is right in the middle, surrounded by your peers. And then you may be familiar with the idea of symbi symbiosis, in which one species guarantees its sustainability by guaranteeing the sustainability of another species. This is a picture of two oxpeckers on the back of a rhino, and they have a symbiotic relationship. The birds hang out on the rhino's back because they know they can find a steady supply of food. They eat the parasites that lodge in a rhino's hard-to-scratch places. What the rhinos get in return is free cleaning services. Now, once I understood that I had been a biomimic, although not like I knew that, I started to wonder if there were other ways in which individuals could look to nature for clues on how to sustain ourselves. And I did find another example. In the years when I was scuffling, I would give the suggestion for change one chance if I gave it any chance at all. And if it didn't do twice what it was promised in half the time, I would throw it out and go back to the way I'd been acting. But these new advisors of mine, the peers and the professionals, they urged me to keep on looking for lifestyle strategies until I found some that worked for me. This is precisely what nature does when it deploys the principle of diversity. In nature, no one strategy works in all places at all times. So what it does is it tries several different strategies, and those that sustain themselves best are the ones that are handed down through generations. It shouldn't come as a surprise that what works for us works for other species, and vice versa, because we are, after all, a species like all the others. It's ironic to me that our species' special ability, higher reasoning, is what lets us think that that's not true. That's not the only quirk that our thinking produces, of course. Have you ever noticed the paradox that many of us live under? Sometimes we think we're powerless. We have no effect, never mind on the world at large, but on our own immediate lives. Other times, we think we're super powerful. We can do whatever we want without ever having to worry about the consequences that would obviously come from the choices that we're making. To look at the first part of that paradox, let's look at smoking. Except smokers and the tobacco industry, I think everybody would pretty much agree that smoking is a wallet-emptying, quality-of-life-lowering, death-hastening practice. And yet, according to the World Health Organization, there are 967 million smokers on the planet. On the other side of that paradox, the idea that we can do whatever we want, I'd like to offer some evidence that we have been thinking this for a very long time. And when I say very long time, I'm talking all the way back to in the beginning. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, we're told that we have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. The first interpretation of a pretty popular passage in the Bible, pretty well-known one, is that we have a responsibility for nature, and I'm, I'm cool with that. I'm glad that that's in the public thinking. But if you look at it again, what it says is that we're not part of nature. We're not only not part of it, we're above it. We have dominion. We can do whatever we want. And we've been doing that for quite some time. By being the thinking species, we get to think foolish ideas like that. We also get to smoke and sun worship our way into cancer and feed ourselves in ways that inflict cruelty on our fellow citizens of the planet while ignoring nature's first rule for sustenance. Will it sustain us? Many of us feed our families according to what's cheapest or easiest or whatever the kids will eat without giving an argument. Now, I like cheap and easy, too. But if we don't put our sustainability first, we're not going to last. I started my talk by relating that I had left my profession of 30 years so that I could become Joey's stay-at-home caregiver. 
Up until a few weeks before we made that decision, I had never considered such an idea. The fact is, I didn't want to be a dad. But my future wife made clear very early on that she was a package deal. My first reaction to that was my default, nope, I know what I want, this ain't it, I'm out of here. But by this time, I'd begun to see, begun to experience the wisdom of letting in other people's passions and perspectives instead of going only by my own. I'd also begun to see lo uh, love as a force of nature. I even came up with a little device to remind me of this. WWLD, what would love do? So I decided I'd follow love. And now, the three of us form our own little family community, and without a doubt, we do sustain ourselves. My quest for personal sustainability has taken me some unexpected places, including the garden. Until seven or eight years ago, I not only didn't garden, I didn't get why anybody would. And now, I have a plot at my house, and I'm a member of a cooperative community garden around the corner from my house. Often, when I go out to work in the garden, I bring Joey with me. If it's just a chance to spend time together, that's good enough. But it's also a way in which we can be reminded of our connections to the planet, reminded of where we fit into the scheme of life, and a reminder that when we work together, together with each other, as well as together with nature, we're committing an act of self-interest. Each choice we make, where we live, what we eat, what we buy, what we support, will either bring us closer to our own sustainability or farther away. Choosing to work toward our own sustainability has practical daily rewards. They pay off in connection, community, and the certainty that when we can actually change the world simply by changing the way we contribute to it. Very few of us in this room, if any, will have much influence generations from now over who makes it through that evolutionary knothole that Janine Benyus talked about in 2008. But when you and I pay attention to our small daily decisions and view it in a long-term way, we do have influence over which ones of us will bloom in our own time. Thank you.